Today's lecture is brought to you courtesy of Ronald Breslow, who um, prepared the slides, or at least one of his TAs might have, that I'm going to show you today as we walk through this last section of aromaticity. Um, Breslow passed away in 2017, but he was a noteworthy chemist throughout his career, uh, winning actually the Priestley Medal, um, which was also won by Henry Eyring, the grandfather of the current president of BYU-Idaho. So he was a big deal in chemistry, and we're going to try to use uh, his knowledge to learn a little bit today. What we want to think about are compounds that are not benzene and ask the question, is any other compound as stable because of its unique ring system as benzene is? So we're going to use a smaller ring system. This is cyclobutadiene. It's essentially uh, a four-membered ring where there's everybody has pi bonds, and then cyclooctatetraene, which is an eight-membered ring that also has full pi bonds. So these are the three compounds, benzene right here, um, and it has alternating pi bonds, the cyclooctatetraene with its alternating pi bonds, and cyclobutadiene. For the sake of simplicity, and this is one of those rare moments where chemists did students a huge favor, is we came up with a system of nomenclature that is really easy. And for any simple ring system where there are alternating pi bonds, we collectively referred to any member of that group, and all three of these compounds are members of that group, as anulenes. A-N-N-U-L-E-N-E. -N -N -E. Anulenes. And then we just specify the number of pi electrons inside of the ring system. So this would be four anulene, this is six anulene, and this is eight anulene. And that's a little easier to say than cyclooctatetraene or uh, cyclobutadiene. This is four anulene, six anulene, eight anulene. I don't think I've ever heard anybody call benzene six anulene, but, um, but it would work. That's technically correct based on the rules. We introduced the concept of aromaticity by looking at the special considerations associated with hydrogenation. When you hydrogenate cyclohexene, you give off 120 kilojoules per mole. That's how much energy that particular bond costs in order for the molecule to maintain. If now you have two pi bonds in the system, you would expect them to have a heat of hydrogenation of 240 kilojoules per mole, twice the 120, and it's slightly lower than that because there is stabilization associated with the conjugated system. But when you fully conjugate the entire ring system, instead of being three times 120 or 360 kilojoules per mole, when you hydrogenate this, you only get 208 kilojoules per mole back out of the system. That's because 152 kilojoules per mole, the difference between the 360 expectation and the 208 reality is what we refer to as the energy associated with the resonance stabilization of benzene. If now you look at that same type of analysis with uh, cyclooctene through two different forms of a semi-conjugated ring system all the way out to 8 anulene, what you'll notice is there is no savings of energy. 4 times 97 should actually be less than 400. And in fact, what you end up with is a compound that is even less stable. The pi bonds store even more energy than you would expect by just multiplying it by 97. So this is a case where there's definitely not any aromatic stabilization associated with the cyclooctatetraene or the 8 anulene. And if you look instead at in the other direction and go smaller, this cyclobutadiene, and I'm not sure why I don't, I can't find the heat of hydrogenation data for this. Maybe I didn't Google the exact right thing, but in my defense, uh, neither did our resident expert. What he showed instead was a different strategy. What this compound does is intentionally disconnect the conjugated pi system by shortening the pi bonds and lengthening the sigma bonds. This is experimentally, what they have observed is that the distance between the two carbons in this cyclobutadiene core structure is 151 picometers or 1.51 angstroms. And the distance between these two carbons is 1.38 angstroms or 138 picometers. Meaning that the pi bond is very short and the sigma bond is very long. 
this stretches the two pi bonds away from each other and prevents them from being conjugated like you would expect this compound to be. If you remember when we looked at the same data for benzene, what, what they found was that all of the bonds in the six-membered ring ended up with the exact same length of 1.40 angstroms, meaning that the pi system was evenly shared across the system. And that's the characteristic of a fully conjugated ring system that you would expect. And in cyclobutadiene, this data, these data suggest that the con that the system is not conjugated, that the pi bond is not fully shared, that they actually partition off. And this shows us that there's something weird going on here. Um, one other uh, piece of evidence that suggests that benzene is truly unique among these three examples is the experimental evidence that the cyclooctatetraene or 8-anuline bends itself intentionally out of plane. If you remember the analogy that I tried to give of what an aromatic or, or sorry, a conjugated system looks like, it's where all the kids play in the collective backyard of the neighborhood. And in order to prevent that from occurring in this cyclooctatetraene, what the molecule does is bend itself in such a way that there are disconnects that exist between the different pi bonds. And so this prevents the pi bonds from resonance delocalizing and being conjugated through the system, this is not a fully conjugated system. Even though when you look at the Lewis structure of it, everything looks fully conjugated, but experimentally we find that it's not fully conjugated, that this molecule essentially does backflips to avoid, to avoid having a conjugated system. So in conclusion, there's some, something going on that occurs whether a cyclic conjugated system is aromatic or not. And benzene is doing it right, and cyclobutadiene and cyclooctatetraene are doing it wrong. So clearly what's going on is that the actual number of pi electrons inside of these ring systems matters. Benzene has six pi electrons, and that seems to work out great. Cyclobutadiene has four, and that's not working out so well. And cyclooctatetraene has eight. That's not working either. So Huckel was the one who conducted the experiments to come up with a numerical pattern of, how, of the number of pi electrons that will work for aromaticity and those that won't. And the pattern he came up with was essentially this. If you have an even number of pi electrons inside of your system, and it's not a multiple of four, then your compound exhibits this aromatic stabilization. But before you can start looking at the number of pi electrons, there are three criteria that you have to meet. First of all, the molecule has to be planar, has to stay flat, which is the opposite of what cyclooctatetraene is doing. It has to be a single ring system. So naphthalene, if you remember that from a previous example, is a bicyclic ring system, and anthrine, uh, phenanthrene and anthracene, I think were the names of the other two. Those were tricyclic ring systems. Those don't apply to, Huckel's rule does not apply to them. And then finally, the system has to be fully conjugated. Everybody in the ring system has to be sp2 hybridized. If those three criteria are, meet, are met, then you count the pi electrons, and if it matches one of these numbers, again, even numbers that are not multiples of four, then it is an aromatic ring system, or at least it has the potential to be. Huckel would suggest that it would be aromatic. Huckel came up with a definition for this that was a mathematical equation. N to a mathematician is a specific, uh, it has meaning, it's an integer. It's, so it's, zero, it's a counting number, zero, one, two, three, four, all the way to infinity with no decimal points. So if you plug any one of these numbers all the way up to infinity into Huckel's equation, then that allows you to calculate one of the possible numbers that will give you the aromatic, kind of that magic number of pi electrons. Now, Huckel's rule, when people ask you, what is Huckel's rule? Probably the most common answer is 4n plus 2. And so I, I, would be, I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't tell you that it was 4n plus 2, but I actually find that students understand it better if you just tell them that it's an even number that's not a multiple of four. So benzene is the one that falls clearly under Huckel's rule. It has six pi electrons, so that's an even number. That's not a multiple of four. But cyclobutadiene has four pi electrons, which is a multiple of four. And cyclooctatetraene has eight pi electrons, which is also a multiple of four. 
So this is where Huckel's rule allows us to predict that benzene would be aromatic and the other two would not be aromatic. In science, a rule is generally some type of mathematical pattern that we identify. That's a law and rules are kind of the same. They're just a pattern. More important than the rule or the law is the theory that explains that pattern. So once Huckel came up with his rule, then he started to think about, okay, what is the explanation for the underlying pattern? And they came up with something that your textbook refers to as frost circles. And a frost circle is not actually a circle. It is a frontier molecular orbital diagram. And you might have some memories of those from when we talked about the Diels-Alder reactions. And you're going to see those same FMO diagrams when we talk about UV-Vis spectroscopy. But the diagrams are actually quite simple when you're trying to explain Huckel's rule. In order to draw a frost circle of a molecule that meets the three criteria, planar, monocyclic, fully conjugated, those will always describe things and examples that I'll show you that are simple geometric shapes. Remembering way back to your days of elementary school, hopefully you recognize that this is a hexagon. And if you take that hexagon and set it on one of its corners and then draw a line underneath every one of the corners of your hexagon, what you have just done is describe the energy levels of the molecular orbitals for the frontier molecular orbitals of benzene. You've just drawn what's called a frost circle. Notice how I have six lines. Each of these lines represent a different molecular orbital for the benzene pi system. And if you connect the dots of these six lines, you will draw a hexagon. I'll go ahead and give you a peek of what it looks like for cyclobutadiene. You just take that square and you turn it so that it's sitting on one of its corners, it becomes a diamond. Then you draw a line underneath each one of those and that becomes your molecular orbital diagram. For cyclooctatetraene or 8-anulene, you take this octagon, set it on a corner, and then you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different molecular orbitals. So drawing the molecular orbital diagrams for all of these uh, kind of Huckel's rule candidates is pretty simple. You just essentially trace out the shape of it with the slotted lines like this. And while we're not going to go through and draw the actual orbitals like I had you do with the Diels-Alder symmetry allowed, symmetry forbidden type questions, we are going to use these lines right here to represent those orbitals energetically. The lowest line is the lowest energy orbital and the top line is the highest energy orbital. Each molecular orbital, which is what each one of these six lines represents, can hold a maximum of two electrons. Benzene, hopefully you recognize, has a total of six pi electrons. That's harder to see in this Robinson circle than it is in the Kekulé structure. But there are six pi electrons, and we fill them from lowest energy until that particular orbital is full. And then we move and put one electron here, one electron over here, and then we pair them up reluctantly until all six of the pi, of the pi electrons have found a home. And when we finish drawing out this diagram, notice how all six of these pi electrons are kind of below the midpoint. This midpoint is the division between bonding on the bottom and anti-bonding on the top. And we'll find two things that are important. First of all, all six of the pi electrons ended up in bonding orbitals, and none of the electrons ended up being unpaired. Unpaired electrons are a special concern with regard to stability. You wanna pair all of your electrons or you're gonna have some stability problems. Now we take this, so this frost circle diagram of benzene says only good things about benzene. Everybody's paired up, everybody's in a bonding orbital, good, good, good. If we move on now and look at cyclobutadiene in that same frost circle diagram, there are a total of two and then four pi electrons. And when you put those four pi electrons in the system, two of them go in the lowest energy orbital and then these two orbitals right here are of equivalent energy. So we put one electron in one orbital, 
with spin up using both Hund's rule and the Pauli exclusion principle from the earliest days of general chemistry, meaning that what this tells us is we have two unpaired electrons, and that's a problem. This essentially, this molecule behaves a lot like a free radical, and those are highly reactive. Also, these electrons are in a non-bonding orbital. They're right on that cutoff line. So they're not helping out at all with the bonding of the molecule. This frost circle diagram, our molecular orbital diagram, tells us something that the Lewis structure doesn't explain very well. Based on this Lewis structure, you would say everybody's sp2 hybridized. This is a fully conjugated ring system. Conjugation generally provides stability. This should be a stable compound. Huckel ran the experiment and told us, no, it's not, because it has four pi electrons. But now with these frost circles, we explain why it's not. The reason that this compound is unstable is because the particular bonding pattern forces two electrons to be unpaired, reactive, rea kind of radical-like electrons in a non-bonding orbital. And hopefully now you can anticipate what's going to happen with cyclooctatetraene that when we put the octagon, and this is an ugly octagon right here that has been drawn out, um, but mine's not any better, so I'll use this one. But there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight total orbitals. Anytime that you have eight pi, sorry, eight p orbital that are atomic orbitals, you should expect to see eight molecular orbitals. There are a total of two, four, six, eight pi electrons, and we pour those into the system. Six of them go into this bonding arrangement, and that's great. Molecules stick together, but two of them right here end up in non-bonding orbitals, and even worse, they're unpaired. And so this is the nature of the lack of stabilization that exists in cyclooctatetraene and cyclobutadiene. So when you kind of want to answer, well, why? Why does Huckel's rule exist? And the answer is, well, the frost circle shows us these unpaired electrons. So you need to be able to kind of remember Huckel's rule, which is mathematically represented as 4n plus 2, and that tells you if a compound is aromatic, and then explain it using these frost circle diagrams. So this is kind of the final uh, summary of the Huckel's rule and frost circle is benzene is uniquely stable, and its nearest cousins are uniquely unstable. And, uh, and if they were planar, uh, they kind of do weird things to not actually be planar in this case and not be fully conjugated, they would be something we refer to as anti-aromatic. So our quest continues to find something as cool as benzene. So what if we have six pi electrons right here, okay, but uh, we have a seven-membered ring? So this is clearly not benzene. It's uh, got a seven-membered ring, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But what you'll notice, though, is that this carbon right here has four distinct bonds coming off of it. So that is an sp3 hybridized carbon. And this no longer, Huckel's rule no longer applies. It has no power here because the system is not fully conjugated. So this is not a candidate for consideration. And so we're going to move on and look at, well, what about other anulenes? Well, let's get big. And so 10 anuline right here. According to Huckel's rule, 10 anulene would have 10 carbons, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Um, all of these carbons are sp2 hybridized, and it's planar, so it meets the three criteria. And it has 10 pi electrons in it. That is an even number that is not a multiple of four. So according to Huckel's rule, 10 anulene should be aromatic. The problem is that a 10-sided regular polygon has an angle of 144 degrees. Uh, using a mathematical equation that I never can remember, but it's the one that tells you the internal angle of a triangle, of an equilateral triangle will be 60, a square will be 90, and a hexagon will be 120. But by the time you get out to this uh, decagon right here, the bond angles are too big to comfortably match the hybridization bond angles you expect for an sp2 hybridized carbon. These carbons want to have a bond angle of 120. So anything you gain from aromaticity, you're going to lose because of bond angle strain. Well, what about 10 anulene? What if we put some trans bonds inside of here and allow everybody to have nice bond angles? And that works pretty well, except for these hydrogens start running into each other. 
So again, everything that you gain from being an aromatic system, you lose because of the steric strain of those hydrogens bumping into each other. So this van der Waals or steric strain that exists between these hydrogens kind of offsets the whole system and you, you don't get any special stabilization out of 10 annuling. So no, this isn't gonna work. So let's go bigger. What about 14 annuline? Well, 14 annuline is, we, it's everybody's fully conjugated. It's monocyclic. Let's assume that it's planar. And we have a total of 14 pi electrons inside the system, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. But we still have, so this meets Huckel's rule based on all criteria. And yet we still run into this issue where these hydrogens are bumping into each other. Hopefully you can kind of appreciate how short they had to draw this bond in order to even get this diagram to work out. So yeah, this isn't gonna work. This has that same steric issue. So any gain of stability you get from an aromatic ring system based on Huckel's rule telling us that 14 is a good number, you're gonna lose because of the steric or van der Waals interactions that occur between the hydrogens. So now 16 annulenes. Uh, 16 annuline is monocyclic, fully conjugated, um, planar, but that right there is a multiple of four. So this does not satisfy the right number. And it does the same deal where the bonds alternate in length, just like cyclobutadiene, so that they don't have to conjugate the system. Um, basically, somebody planted a hedge in between the collective backyards of what would be the coolest uh, neighborhood ever. You know, these kids playing with each other, but the parents said no. Just they, they just they disconnect the conjugated system. So now we finally get to 18 annuline. And uh, this is kind of a unique compound and really visually quite satisfying when you look at this, the Lewis structure of it. You end up with a fully conjugated systems, planar. This is an even number that's not a multiple of four. Um, uh, angelic voices are starting to sing. This thing meets all those criteria that you expect for an aromatic ring system, except it's floppy. And so in any solution, even in the gas phase, you're gonna have molecules that are gonna collide with this ring system at high speeds, speeds uh, closer to the speed of light than the speed at which you could possibly run. And so when they collide with this ring system, if that causes the ring to shake and the pi system to go non-planar, then that's gonna destabilize the fully conjugated ring system. And that's exactly what happens with 18 annuline. It's just too big and too floppy. I think about it like pizza dough. There's a massive extra, extra large pizza and uh, spin that thing all you want, it's still gonna be droopy. So it's just really hard for this thing to stay planar. And it's fairly stable, like it's more stable than you would expect, but it's not nearly as good as benzene. So um, the story of the annulenes is kind of a sad story of collective failure. And the only really truly aromatic compound that we find that contains only carbons and hydrogens is benzene. But wait, there's more. So what if we give up on the idea of a neutral compound? What if we introduce a carbocation cation into the system? Carbocations cations are sp2 hybridized. And so uh, this word right here, the cycloheptatrienyl cation is a planar compound, it's criteria one. Everybody is sp2 hybridized, that's criteria two and it's monocyclic, that's criteria three, so we're ready to consider Huckel's rule. There are two, four, six total pi electrons in the system, so this meets Huckel's rule. And sure enough, this is a, an unusually stable carbocation, which is funny to say these words together, very stable and carbocation, they sound like saying a super strong two-year-old. Like it's just not two things that you typically associate with each other, carbocations are usually quite unstable. And so the way to think about this is, well, given all of the carbocations that exist out there in the world, this one is very stable for a carbocation. So it's not like it's as stable as benzene, but for a carbocation, it has unique aromatic resonance stabilization. And they actually kind of draw the same circle that they do in benzene. They just put a positive charge in the middle of this, and it's given a common name of the tropilium ion, which is awfully fun to say. Um, there it is, the tropilium cation right there. That's be a great name for a child. If you have the cycloheptatrienyl cation right here, so let's say that you have this compound uh, and you build this in a laboratory. In fact, if you had 
uh, used NBS and put this at the allylic position that could build that compound. And what they find is experimentally, it actually behaves more like an ionic compound. The true definition of an ionic compound is that it conducts electricity in the liquid state. And that's what they find for this particular ion. And it would not conduct electricity if there was a covalent bond linking that carbon to that bromine. So I think this is cool. I didn't know this until I saw these notes right here that this compound is ionic. I think that's really cool. Um, but it's just because of the special aromatic resonance stability of the tropillion cation. What if we go the other direction? So this right here is a five-membered ring, and this carbon is a carbanion. Lone pairs, and this is what you need to see as we move forward, lone pairs can choose between ending up in a hybridized orbital or an unhybridized p orbital if it allows them to be aromatic. Now, some of you might remember when I said earlier that lone pairs always go in hybridized orbitals unless they don't. And this is a case where they don't. But, but when I said that at the very beginning of the semester, you probably didn't know about aromaticity. And so it wouldn't have been useful to tell you that exception. This is the exception. When a lone pair exists inside of a monocyclic ring system, it can push the lone pair into a p orbital so as to hybridize this atom in the sp2 hybridization state and then it meets all the criteria for us to break out Huckel's rule and see what it has to tell us. So remember the three criteria, it has to be planar. This would definitely exist in a plane. It has to be monocyclic, so a single ring, and it has to be fully conjugated. These carbons right here are definitely sp2 hybridized, and this carbon will choose to be sp2 hybridized if it gets aromaticity out of that choice. So now that the system is fully conjugated, let's count the pi electrons. There's two here, there's two here. And if these two electrons chose to occupy an unhybridized p orbital, then they will play the game of the pi electrons and they count as pi electrons. So there's two, four, six pi electrons, and this is an aromatic anion. So tropelium ion is an aromatic cation, something with a net positive charge. This is an aromatic anion with a net negative charge. You can be creative in the way you chose to show, choose to show that anion. This looks kind of cool. Um, and then if you think about the typical pKa, a carbon-hydrogen bond, we should have learned earlier, has a pKa in the ballpark of 60. If it's at the allylic position, that actually makes the pKa much, much, much lower because of resonance delocalization of the negative charge, something in the ballpark of 30. But if that negative charge can now resonance delocalize into an aromatic ring system, your pKa drops from an expected 30 for an allylic system down to 16. That is 14 orders of magnitude more acidic. Uh, let's see, 14 would be 100 quadrillion, I believe. It's 100 quadrillion times more acidic than if this were just a simple allylic system. The resonance provides that much stabilization of the conjugate base that it makes this compound that much more acidic. When you start throwing out words like 100 quadrillion, people think you're just making numbers up. And so that's that's a ridiculous amount of additional acidity that you get. Uh, it's the ballpark of an alcohol at that point. Um, here's to appreciate the resonance delocalization of the negative charge, more appreciation of the resonance delocalization of the negative charge, more appreciation, more appreciation, more appreciation. Okay, so that negative charge inside of this anion can kind of roll all throughout the ring system right here because of resonance delocalization. And instead of a negative one charge sitting on a carbon, you have a negative one-fifth charge sitting on each of the five carbons in the ring system. Um, if we just compare that now with the cycloheptatriene, if you pop this hydrogen off and turn that into a negative charge, that negative charge will have resonance delocalization within the ring system, but only if that carbon is sp2 hybridized, pushes those lone pairs into the p orbital, and gives this system eight total pi electrons, which is not what Huckel's rule is looking for. Eight is a multiple of four. It does not follow the 4n plus 2 rule. This actually raises the pKa a little bit because if you pluck that hydrogen off and leave behind a negative charge, 
you start to approach this idea of anti-aromaticity. So this is a this is a problem. Eight pi electrons within this system would be anti-aromatic, and that actually adds instability to the compound. So this is less acidic than you would expect. Um, what if we go even smaller? So they take this system right here. Remember that Huckel's rule tells us that you're looking for any even number of electrons that is not a multiple of four. So we started off with benzene, which is six, but what if you go down to two? Well, the best example of that is this cyclopropenyl cation right here. Um, and so there are one, two, three total carbons in the system. This is monocyclic, it's planar. And if this carbon is a carbocation, then everybody is fully conjugated right there. And so we can do that little cutesy thing where we draw a circle in the middle and put a positive charge in there. And this is an aromatic uh, cation. Not quite as impressive as the tropilium ion, mostly because this aromatic cation still has all the issues of angle strength. There's even more creative versions. They'll actually do the cyclooctatetraene dianion. So if you make two different carbons with negative charges, you have a net negative two charge right here. Um, those are really hard to find. Carbons carrying extra electron density is rare indeed. But this allows both of these carbons right here to switch from a standard sp3 to sp2. That fully conjugates the ring system and gives it two, four, six, eight, ten total pi electrons. That's one of the magic numbers that Huckel gives us. So this is an aromatic dianion, and uh, this is kind of a cool compound as well. I've, I've never been able to play with this one in the laboratory. Finally, what if we put things inside of the ring system that are not carbons? So heteroatoms are atoms that contain lone pairs. And so we're talking about primarily oxygens and sulfurs and nitrogens can be built into the ring system of an aromatic system, and they will contribute to that aromaticity. Uh, these are often referred to as HACs, heter heterocyclic aromatic compounds. So here are some examples. Pyridine is an old friend. We've used this as a solvent and a catalytic base. Uh, pyrrole is not one that you've probably encountered. Furan. Um, in the laboratory portion of the course, there is a solvent referred to as tetrahydrofuran, where we put, where we hydrogenate furan to get rid of the pi bonds. But furan is an example, and in fact, all three of these compounds, all four of these compounds, are aromatic, and so we need to be able to explain why they exhibit this special aromatic stabilization. You don't need to know the names or structures of these compounds. You should know the name and structure of pyridine because it's shown up in enough mechanisms. But the other three, uh, you can just continue not knowing anything about these ones as far as their names. You do need to understand the aromaticity, so we'll talk about that now. Uh, a couple of other ones, uh, let's just move on to what happens. So pyridine right here, this nitrogen looks like it's sp2 hybridized based on the old rules where you count, a double bond counts as one group, this single bond counts as the second group, and the lone pair counts as the third group. Three groups of electrons that surround an atom make it sp2 hybridized. It's already sp2 hybridized. This lone pair right here is not part of the ring system because that pi bond is. So we have two, four, six pi electrons. This follows every aspect of Huckel's rule. It's monocyclic, it's planar, fully conjugated, and there are six pi electrons. Pyridine is an aromatic nitrogen-containing heterocyclic aromatic compound. Pyrrole is also aromatic, and the reason that it's aromatic is because this nitrogen right here switches its hybridization from, if this were general chemistry, and I gave you this structure, I would expect the student to tell me that this nitrogen was sp3 hybridized, and that's wrong. You would think it was sp3 because there are three different single bonds coming off the nitrogen and a lone pair. That's a total of four electron groups, and four electron groups is supposed to be sp3 hybridization. But in a monocyclic planar ring system, the nitrogen can and will change its hybridization to become sp2, forcing those two electrons into a p orbital giving this a total of six pi electrons, two, four, and when the nitrogen changes its hybridization, that's the, the fifth and sixth electrons. 
So pyrrol is an aromatic compound as well. Furan will do the same thing that pyrrol does. Uh, one of the oxygen lone pairs ends up being tossed into this aromatic ring system, and the other lone pair gets shoved out of the ring system. Because this lone pair in pyrrol is tied up inside the ring system, this compound is an unusually weak base for a nitrogen. Nitrogens are generally pretty basic. They pull hydrogens off. But this lone pair is tied up in the ring system and is very, very weak as a base because if you were to try to put a proton on there and turn that nitrogen into a positive charge, you would lose the aromaticity. So experimentally, that's how we show that pyrrol is, um, is, is aromatic. Now let's go look at the thiophene. It's related, thiophene right here is related to furan. The sulfur can also choose between sp2 and sp3 hybridization. By going sp2, it tosses one of these pairs of electrons into the ring system, and you end up with two, four, six total pi electrons. Um, these two examples right here are fully conjugated, and these are aromatic, but they don't follow Huckel's rule because one of the things of Huckel's rule is that we only consider monocyclic ring systems. And so this is one that um, I wouldn't ask you to tell me if the rings were uh, aromatic or not, simply because Huckel's rule isn't supposed to apply to these bicyclic ring systems. Uh, chemists have come up with caveats that allow us to apply Huckel's rule to bicyclic ring systems, but we're not going to worry about those.